I'm really actually very delighted to be here tonight. And it's, I, I joke, I've been joking a lot that I, I've been sort of like the bridesmaid um, at all of these events because I'm always moderating events, but I've never been the bride. And now I feel like tonight, it's, it's my research. You get to learn about my, my work. So I'm, I'm feeling very honored to be here. Um, and, and to share, to share uh, I, I'm gonna share a bunch of different things and I wanna make sure we have enough time for question and answer at the end so that if I didn't touch on something that you are interested in or that I could potentially shed some light on, I can make sure to, to try to share that with you tonight. Let me start by telling you a little bit more about myself. A lot of people know, um, if you've taken, you know, students know at the University of Denver where I've been teaching for nine years that I work on women in war. I go to parties or to, I was at a wedding, my cousin's wedding this past weekend, and everyone says, what do you do? What are you a professor of? And I said, oh, I, you know, I, I work on women in war and I teach classes on comparative genocide. It's a real buzzkill. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you that I am not very fun to bring to parties because the second people start to ask questions, they start to really go, get worried. You know, gosh, how did you get into this? You know, why? You seem like a nice, happy person. You know, why did you, why did you choose to do this with your, with your life? And it's taken me a lot of thinking and reflection to try to really understand that myself. And I wanna share with you, I think, something about my own personal experience that helps to explain that a little bit. And if you'll remember, I actually shared this with you, the last panel that I moderated, which is that my dad was 18 years old when he was actually a high school dropout. And he had kind of flunked out of school and, or been kicked out of school, there's different stories. And he actually hitchhiked down to Mexico. And he was sort of bumming it on the beach and he was fishing. And one day he got a package of mail from home that had been in route for, for many weeks. And in the middle of that package of mail was a draft notice. He didn't have a high school diploma, um, so he couldn't go to college. He had no religious affiliation, so he wasn't going to be able to you know, claim a conscientious subjector. But my 18-year-old father found himself all of a sudden, actually two weeks late to report to duty. And he scrambled back to the US and he showed up for basic training. And he spent the next six weeks or whatever it was training. And then shortly thereafter was sent to Vietnam where he fought uh, alongside many folks probably in this room. When my father came back, he was changed. He had seen what war looks like up close, and he told stories to us, his children, his four children, growing up about what war was like. Some of the stories were awful. They were stories he told me with a level of levity because he had had the distance to make, you know, to make some sense of it. But for me as a child, they were really alarming and, and I think, settled into my gut at a very early age that war is something that nobody benefits from. That human beings suffer, whether you're a part of the invading army or whether you are part of the, um, the, you know, the, the civilian population that experiences it. I grew up also knowing that I had this grandfather, his father, he was this guy. He was a total hippie beatnik uh, guy that was a writer. His name's Don Barry. And he was very anti-war, very much in the peace movement, very much a kind of a, a, a critic of kind of US militarism and things like that. And I always knew him as my grandfather. And he passed away when I was quite young, so I didn't know him well. But it wasn't until much later that I realized that I actually had a biological grandfather who was my father's father, who was this guy, Archie, who had been drafted and sent to Korea when he was 23 years old. And it was in these legacies, this kind of family lore that came out around the experience of war and what it does to change people that I think I found my footing in this quest to really understand how people survive in the aftermath of war, 
and how people manage to go on, manage to thrive, and also sometimes suffer profoundly from the trauma that they witnessed, from their experiences of harm, and for the knowledge that they couldn't have done something maybe to stop it. So for me, I think this kind of family story and, and actually learning that my very name, my name is Marie Berry. My last name is the middle guy's last name, right? Not the third guy's last name. And I realized that why that's the case is because when my paternal grandfather did come back for Korea, he was a nasty guy. And he really wreaked havoc on his wife and on his children. And so my grandmother left him and changed the entire family's name to the new husband's name, right? So I, I like to think of my own name, Barry, as a product in some ways of this legacy of war. And I, I, I take that, you know, with no, um, I take that with a, with a sense of motivation to try to think about how I can use my career and my, and my life on this planet to try to think about ways to eradicate war and to protect kind of that, that, um, that process. You're all good. So this question of how do people survive after war, why do some people manage to rebuild their lives, why other people falter, has really been the question that's motivated my research over the past 20 years. And I found myself kind of following these questions um, uh, in college and immediately after college when I took my first trip to Rwanda. During college, I was working with Holocaust survivors. I was very involved with thinking about, actually I was working on writing curriculum for the Washington State Public Schools on Holocaust education, on human rights education. And I, through that work, ended up in Rwanda in 2007 for the first time. This was about 13 years after the end of the Rwandan genocide. And some of you may have been to Rwanda, but in 2007, you really felt it. You really felt the legacy of that genocide present in the way that you walked down the street, in the way that you saw these purple signs dotting the hills, dotting the roads, you know, showing sites in which people had been killed, people had been massacred during the genocide. It was very fresh. And I had come to Rwanda expecting at some way this story, right, this story of war, right, the story of suffering. And I remember one day um, walking with my, my friend who I became very close to, to his house where he had grown up. And um, we were walking down this dirt road and um, I remember, you know, the, the kind of casualness at which he said, come over, come for tea to my house. And we were walking and he, at one point I remember, pointed to a church, a very small, unassuming church. And he said, that's where my parents are. It didn't register to me at the moment that he said this, that of course this is where his parents are buried. Um, and I learned later that it was where many more members of his family were buried. But we continued walking to his house and in his house was his sister. His sister, um, I'll call her Esther, it's not her real name, um, welcomed me and she greeted me and she, she, she said, can I show you something? Yeah. Out back, she wanted to show me this, well, a goat. There was a really cute goat. <laughs> and I think goats are still really cute. Um, there were chickens and there was a little shed and in the shed were, were these piles of mattresses. And she was showing me because she was very proud. She had been able to start a small business that was building mattresses, and, or not building mattresses, sewing mattresses, constructing mattresses, and kind of you know, trying to find ways of, of creating this, this kind of um, income generation that would allow her to sustain her life. We went back in the house and she started talking a little bit more about her life. And I learned, I knew that my friend had survived the genocide. And of course I assumed that his sister had as well. And she described over the next hour what had happened because it was right there in that house that malicious had come to the door. She was 14 years old. They had um, taken her father first. They didn't know what had happened. 
And then they had come back for her mother and for the children. And her mother was killed in front of her. Her younger sibling was killed and she ran. As she ran, she ended up finding shelter in a well where she climbed under the, kind of down into the well and, and hid. And she hid for weeks in the well. She would come out sometimes at night if she possibly could to find a little bit of food whenever there were no sounds above. But she survived and until the day that there was a member of the Rwandan Patriotic Front who knocked and basically was trying to find anybody, that, any Tutsi that was hiding somewhere in her neighborhood and finally said, it's safe to come out. And when she emerged from the well, she hadn't slept horizontally in weeks, which is why she said the first thing she did when she got back to her house is make a mattress. The entire house had been looted, it had been ransacked, nothing was left, right? But she said the first thing I needed was to create some sense of comfort. And she built these mattresses not to make money at first. She built them to try to give them to other orphans in her neighborhood, to allow them some semblance of comfort in their own homes after they'd experienced this horrific violence. After she got this little mattress making company off the ground, she became a pretty well-respected member of her community. And at one point, some of the local leaders came to her and they said, hey, we're looking for judges to serve on the Gachacha courts, the kind of transitional justice courts in Rwanda. And we think you would be a good one. So for the next decade, she both ran her mattress company and she served as a judge on the second circuit of Gachacha courts trying genocide crimes. And she described to me how proud she was, right, of this experience. And I remember sitting in her house thinking, I was expecting the story, I was expecting the story of suffering I was expecting the story of harm, but I wasn't expecting the story of resilience, of creativity, of care that her experience so clearly symbolized. And as I spent more time in Rwanda and continued doing work there in, um, for many years between 2007 and 2012, I spent a lot of time in Rwanda, I met more and more women who had had similar experiences of suffering and of, and of trauma, but alongside that experience was one of grit, of bravery, of power. And many of you may know, and this is a complicated story in some ways, that it was the year after I first got there in 2008 that Rwanda elected the world's highest level of women to parliament. They then continued to top that and um, in the next elections elected the world's only, at the time, majority of women in parliament. And all the way to this day, Rwanda has 61% of its parliamentarians are women. So there's a complication to that story, which is that Rwanda is not a democracy. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of really repressive things that the government does. And I can talk more of that, about that if anyone's interested, I wrote a book about it. So it, you know, it, was a, it was a big part of my life. But the story that I think was really formative for me was the story about the kind of two simultaneous truths. The truth about the suffering and the victimization of women during armed conflict and war, but the simultaneous truth about the kind of resilience of the human spirit, the creativity, the solidarity and the connections that many women found in community with others. I cannot tell you how many stories I heard of women connecting with other women in their communities to help repair their homes, to take care of their children, to put things a bit more right in their communities. And this, this, this grit, this drive to try to build a life that was not going to experience the same forms of destruction and harm that they'd lived through.
this looked in many ways, and this was sort of the focus of my research, was this wasn't a couple one-off stories, right? We actually saw that in Rwanda, there was this, this proliferation of small organizations that were led by women in the aftermath of the genocide. One count puts it at over 15,000 new small community organizations, oftentimes organized to try to repair the harms in their lives, in their households, right? And I think that when we read about war and we read about genocide, we oftentimes don't hear those stories. We don't hear those kind of creative ways that people are oftentimes asserting their power and trying to build a better life. It was 2010 when I found my way to Bosnia for the first time, exactly 15 years after the Bosnian War had ended in 1995. And in many ways, I was asking the same questions. How do people survive after war? How do people thrive? Or do, why do some people crumble? And the reality was that I found very similar stories, these stories of women in Bosnia who had been tremendously impacted by the war, who had survived unfathomable horrors, who had lost loved ones, who had lost children, and who found ways to demand rights to, to carve out spaces to rebuild their communities. This is a picture of a group of women creating a, basically rebuilding a garden in the, um, in, the, in the area around Srebrenica. So this is right outside of Tuzla. Many of you have probably heard of what happened in Srebrenica in 1995. It was a three day long massacre of boys and men, 8,000 boys and men killed over a three day period of time in a so-called UN safe haven which if you're hearing those words come up again right now in the news, is making a lot of Bosnians feel very, very worried and uncomfortable. But this safe haven was overrun by militants. And there, as you can imagine, this was a massacre of men and boys. And so you had a lot of women that survived without their sons, without their husbands, without their fathers. And what I, what I wanna share is you know, yes, again, the two simultaneous truths, the hardships, the horror of that loss, but the creative ways that women found to create gardens where they grew flowers, to rebuild their homes so that they could re-territorialize the space that had been associated with destruction and find a way to make it about family again, to make it about the future again. And to also organize in ways that began to demand justice. And so it, to this day, if you go to parts of Bosnia, including Tuzla, you'll find on the 11th of every month, a group of women, mostly women, who go into the town square holding signs with the names of their loved ones that were killed in that massacre, that genocide, walking into the square and saying to the powers that be, whether it's the political elites from their towns and also though to the international community that was very much there. We demand some sort of justice because so many of them in particular have never found their loved one's remains. This remains one of the most kind of protracted, difficult challenges is that there hasn't been a burial for so many of the people that were killed in this period of time. And these women are resiliently, persistently, you know, um, angry. And they, they, they take this kind of, these steps, right, to demand this type of, of recognition, to demand some sort of justice for, for what they experience. So I share those anecdotes with those two cases because it's led to my overarching research for the past four years, which is called the Women's Rights After War Project. This is a very large, very ambitious research project that I run in collaboration with my partner in crime. Her name's Millie Lake. She's at the London School of Economics. She's a political scientist. 
And Millie and I came together, we tried to put our heads together and say, why are we, why are we talking so much about the destruction during war? There is that, of course, but we're not necessarily talking about how women are organizing in these brave and creative ways to carve out spaces of care, of normalcy, and of power in, the, in, these, in these horrific contexts. So for the last four years, we've been running this research project that's looked at these questions. What is the impact of war on women? Which women have been able to benefit from opportunities like political participation in Rwanda or like some of you may be familiar with the Women, Peace and Security agenda or with um, economic reforms or any sort of legal reforms that oftentimes happen after a war. And then kind of third, this third question is really what I'm gonna focus on today, which is how are women mobilizing to combat ongoing violence? How are they working to stop it? Are they working to stop violence and to repair the harms in the aftermath? So I won't get into the details of this research project because there's so many parts to it and there's so many dynamics to it. I just wanna summarize a couple of kind of key findings for all of you. Um, the, the, the project has unfolded in six countries. We've been working in Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Bosnia, Iraq, Colombia, and Nepal. And for if anyone's kind of a historical, um, you know, little like interested in kind of why we selected these six countries. I'll just tell you that they've all experienced war in the past three decades. They've also all tried to put together and put in place a suite of gender reforms, women's empowerment policies in the aftermath of the, of the conflict. This is oftentimes done through the rewriting of constitutions. When wars end, oftentimes constitutions get redrafted. And many of you in the room who've worked in diplomacy know so much that the international community oftentimes is very involved in that process of redrafting constitutions, of rewriting laws. And in general, the goal is for these constitutions or these legal reforms to make the country more stable, more inclusive, and ultimately to make a peace that is more durable. Um, and so they're really important. These post-war moments, I think, are really important for thinking about how we build more gender justice, more equality, and so on. The other kind of detail here is that these six countries all had very different war endings. So Rwanda and Sri Lanka had military victories, where one side, the state, well, in Rwanda it was flipped, um, basically, wins the war through a military kind of um, success. In Bosnia and Iraq, you've got power sharing and kind of a federalist agreement where the states are quite literally bifurcated. They're chopped up into different districts. So you've got you know, Iraqi Kurdistan and then the rest of Iraq. In Bosnia, you have the Republika Srpska and you have the Federation. And then in Colombia and Nepal, you have real power sharing agreements with an incorporation of the rebel groups into the government. So that's just a little detail there. Lots of different parts to the project, interviews, surveys, um, a data set, a bunch of mapping, et cetera, lots of, lots of field work. So I just wanna summarize some of the things we found because I think they help shed light on some of the ongoing pressing issues when it comes to thinking about gendered rights um, across the globe. Um, the first is a really depressing finding. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what we found in a lot of places that have a, a very inclusive, um, uh, so let me, let me focus on one thing. What we found in places that have political gender quotas. So by this I mean the government says a third of all of the seats are going to be held by women. We're gonna say that. Or it mandates that political parties have to include a certain number of women on their ballots. Um, uh, different systems have different types of quotas. Um, but what we found is that a lot of times, in a lot of these places, who we, 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 we are really happy and excited about the increase of women in politics in many of these places. And we've seen increases in almost all of those six countries, really dramatic increases. Of course, Rwanda is sort of at the top, but you also have a lot more women in, in, in Colombia, for instance, and in Nepal. 
um, in Iraq and Sri Lanka. What we found is in the, the percentage varies very dramatically across all of the cases, but we found this, um, this way in which oftentimes political elites or the government is taking these women's rights and using them for their own agendas. So in the case of Rwanda, you have a president, Paul Kagame, that has consolidated power very aggressively and has really repressed um, free speech, uh, processes of democratic participation, and has been accused of many human rights violations. And so what happens with these kind of stories of women's empowerment is that you get this number of women in government, but a lot of them are serving the goals of the, of, of the president. Right? We see this in, in, in many different cases in different ways. Second quick, quick point here. We call, this is a very academic-y sort of summary, but um, one of the things we say is that the, uh, what we found is that in each of these places, the opportunities for gendered rights are oftentimes um, of court, afforded to different women based on different experiences of violence. One of our surveys that looked at um, the experience of where insecurity comes from in women's lives in Nepal and in Colombia found that a lot of the insecurity is not coming from armed actors. It's not coming from the, you know, the, the militants. Oftentimes it's coming in Nepal from environmental destruction. So this is a picture I took out of the, um, out of the side of a, a you know, a, a, a kind of a car in the south of Nepal on the border with India in Janakpur, where I got a lung infection on the, on the way. And I was coughing like crazy. And, and I ended up having to take antibiotics to clear the lung infection because it was just, it was, I was so, it was so lodged in there. And as I was coughing during these interviews, so many of the women said, us too. There are no healthy women in this area. The, the, it's, it's cataracts, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, um, premature births. All of these, this laundry list of, of health ailments that they attribute, rightfully, to air pollution. Air pollution, oftentimes it's coming over from India, but it's also air pollution that is from some of the kind of unregulated industry that is in this part of the, of the, of the country. And the temperature in these places is growing incredibly, it's getting hotter. Right? And so you see deforestation and you see the kind of the dying of trees. Um, and women are saying this is actually the bigger deal. Yeah, the Maoists were here. Yeah, the police are kind of really repressive in some ways in this part of the, it, to certain groups. But the really, the biggest struggle that we have right now is the environment. And I think that's really interesting. Um, the final thing is, you know, it's, it's that we, what we, <laughs> What we found is that in a lot of these cases, what you see is the advancement of women's rights reforms without the investment and the resourcing of the implementation of those reforms from the structural state level, but also all the way down to civil society, right? And that's kind of the summary, but what we see is these really nice packages, these really nice advertised, okay, we have this gender quota, or we're gonna advance a national action plan on women, peace, and security, but we're not funding it. We're not um, finding ways to really uh, back it up or enforce it. We're just kind of doing a dance, right? A bit of a smoke screen, if you will. And then the reality is that there's not any change in people's lives. And so this, this again, a little bit of a discouraging um, finding. Um, across all six countries about, uh, about the limits of these rights reforms. And I think this is a great quote that kind of um, sums it up from an activist in Nepal who says, you know, an elephant has these two big tusks. It scares people with the tusks. But the tusks aren't used to eat. He has another tongue inside his mouth to eat. Political parties have taken a policy to show that we are sensitive towards women. But... Uh, um, but it is just like the tusks. It is like a show, right? The way that people are eating, the way that the party operates hasn't changed at all. And I think this is, again, for those of us interested in gender justice, really important to think about what it would take. What does it mean? 
How do we actually fundamentally change and advance gender equality around the globe beyond the super, superficial level? So what does this all mean? And kind of what is, my, what is my point here? Well, we're living in a world in which war, and you know, we're seeing this in this past week in a very devastating way, where war is not a thing of the past. The never agains that we heard after the Nazi Holocaust, unfortunately are happening again and again. To compound that fact, we are in the 17th straight year of global democratic decline the erosion of democracy and the kind of rolling back of rights as an aggregate across the globe has been going down and down. And the best solutions that we've been putting forth, especially these ones related to getting more inclusive democracies built, democracies that encourage women's participation or that encourage ethnic and racial minorities inclusion, that we're seeing that even those progressive efforts are falling short. So the question becomes, what do we do, right? What do we do? And I wanna make, I wanna make two kind of points tonight. The first, you know, without a doubt, and I think many of you are probably feeling this right now, looking at the news, is that there's a need to urgently defend those at most risk of oppression and violence in all forms. And the second, which I want to kind of close my presentation with you all tonight, is that we have to think more boldly, more creatively about how we actually do social change work to push back on these worrisome trends, to think about how we actually do more bold and creative work to challenge the limited limited impact of these top-down reforms empowering women and to think about how we might build from the bottom up, from the grassroots up, opportunities for really thinking about what gender justice and inclusive democracy, participatory democracy mean for everybody. So I have a little couple stories that I want to close with tonight. And it, it, they relate to Colorado because all of the stories that I want to share with you are from women that have participated in the program that I convene at the University of Denver called the Inclusive Global Leadership Initiative. We've been working for seven years, and what we've been trying to do is find these creative, bottom-up ways of thinking about how we build that more free, that more just world. So this is a woman named Ketakondriana Rafitosin, and she is one of the most fierce, powerful women I've ever met in my life. She's from Madagascar, and she was a judge when she graduated. She has two PhDs, two, from two different universities. And she was a judge. Um, before she got her PhDs, actually, which is a very prestigious uh, profession to be in in Madagascar. But Kay, as she goes by, actually resigned from her position as a judge when she got a sense of the endemic nature of corruption in Madagascar society. And I kind of remember hearing Kay talk about this and thinking, well, what do you mean corruption, right? I mean, I've 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 seen the the spot fines, right, or the you know the little bribes you pay and things like that. And of course, we we know about corruption at different scales, I think, um, <laughs> and we read about it. But Kay was like, "All right, let me give you an example." She said, "So you're having a baby." This is a very difficult example, actually. Just as a heads up. You're having a baby and they bring the woman in the middle of the delivery to the operating room and they start the operation, but in the middle of the operation, they'll come, the doctors will come back to the family and they'll say, um, everything is progressing, but you have to give us money now and otherwise we will let her die and the baby die too. But where can we find people money, Kay says, because the average salary in Madagascar is about $50 a month and the bribes they're asking for are about 200. So it's extortion, you know, in this exceptionally brutal moment. And she's, and, and Kay says, I hear these things and I saw these things and as a judge, I was actually being bribed, you know, in this way that wouldn't let me adjudicate the decisions in, according to the letter of the law. 
because the, 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 the level of corruption was so deep. And Kay said, I, you know, I was so discouraged because I am very, very fond of democracy and social justice, but it's useless to fight in those areas as long as the corruption is there, right? The first thing to tackle is corruption. And so what did Kay do? Kay began to organize. She began to organize in her, um, in her, on a bus. She actually began to organize on a bus. She saw um, people littering on the bus, right? They would litter like lychee, like the, the, the skin from a lychee fruit. They would litter this. And she began to say, you know, this is affecting everybody, right? Everybody has to slip on these little slimy kind of uh, shells. It doesn't look nice. Everything about this is, you know, but nobody's benefiting from this. And so she began to find ways of doing, um, getting on a bus and trying to get the people on the bus to recognize a collective action problem, right? The issue was that everybody else was tossing the, 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 the husks. It wasn't that people liked the husks on the ground. Right? So she began to use public transportation as a site for organizing. And then she started to think about how she could get children into this process by building theater groups at elementary schools where they actually played out what it would look like to have a, say, a healthy delivery without any sort of corruption involved or a political process that didn't actually rest on the massive sort of like monetary corruption of particular business interests and elites in Madagascar. So this, 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 um, this incredible woman became a fierce advocate of civil resistance, of people power, of organizing in the community, you know, like any one of us could, um, to try to, to try to build a better, a better place for, for, um, for her, you know, for her community and for her country. This incredible woman is Farida Nambarema. I'm pr proud to call her among my closest friends. She is a fierce democracy activist from Togo. And if you don't know anything about Togo, it's a tiny country in West Africa that has had the family in charge for the longest period of time, the Nisimbes. And with Togo, this, the kind of, the level of corruption has changed over time, not corruption, I should say, the level of dictatorship or authoritarian regime has changed over time, but it remains to this day a very, very difficult place to actually have democracy. So Farida has been um, working largely from exile because she was charged or there was a process of really, really putting her in danger in the country. So she's been working in all these different ways to think about how to mobilize women, women in particular, to begin to demand rights. One of the reasons for this is that there has been rampant sexual violence in Togo that has not been, um, uh, ha had any sort of kind of reflection in the judicial process, but no justice whatsoever and really no recognition. Um, let me skip this quote just because I want to kind of give you some more time to ask questions. But this idea of, of she talks about what it feels like to live in a, in a dictatorship. And she talks about Nisimbe's sort of um, the, the, the cult of personality that he had. He, you know, uh, they he would mobilize these soldiers from the militia. They called them the savage. They had these big beards. And if you went out past 7 o'clock, if you found yourself in the streets, the savages would get you. Her uncle was murdered um, by the regime. Her grandfather was imprisoned by the regime. And it's really part of the regime's stranglehold on democracy is a legacy of the colonial kind of um, administration that was there. And so Farida's creativity in her, in her work is to mobilize women. It's actually, um, lately it's been really interesting. She's been using different technologies to think about how people can collaborate, connect, and actually communicate because, you know, one of the biggest, most favorite tactics of dictators is to turn off the internet. So activists all over the globe struggle when the internet gets turned off. It's really hard to communicate. So Farida has worked with a team of other activists to create these mesh networks that rely on Bluetooth and radio frequencies to begin to actually continue to organize even when the internet is turned off. So she's used technologies like that to think creatively about, again, how we continue to push for democracy. Here's another quick story from Venezuela. Um, you know, lots of, lots of like, difficulty in Venezuela and a tremendous amount of poverty. 
Um, and if you look at the kind of picture on your left, you'll see a, you know, a really um, gross looking <laughs> corner because in many of the poorest neighborhoods, there's been no municipal services or government services now for years. So no garbage pickup, no, you know, no, no things like that. And this, this woman, Kati, had a, um, two members of her family were killed in some level of gang and narco violence that was happening in this very, very poor um, neighborhood in Caracas. And she felt very hopeless. She felt very um, unable to do anything and she felt like the entrenchment of the dictatorship was so heavy there that she didn't know what to do. And what ended up happening is that she organized in her community these art campaigns to turn these corners that were sites of garbage and of, of, you know, kind of blight into these possibilities for expression that bring back a sense of pride to the people that live in the community, to restore some sense of community engagement as well as everybody participated in actually painting these murals. And she's done these murals all over um, her neighborhood. So finally, finally, because it leads us into, I think, what we can talk about today, I've been, you know, a lot of these people have been involved in peace work. This is a woman, Christine Ahn, who's incredible. And the pictures are a little flipped here, but if you look up at the one on the upper left corner, it includes uh, Lema Bowie, Nobel Peace Prize laureate from Liberia, includes Gloria Steinem, it includes other Nobel laureates as well, with Christine walking across the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea in 2015. And they took this march to say, women of the world are going to put our feet down and say no more war. Those of you who know, this kind of connects all the way back to my opening story, right? That even though that, uh, that my grandfather fought in Korea and really shaped the course of his family's life, the Korean War was never formally ended. There was just an armistice. We marked 70 years since the armistice this past July. And so this group of peace activists has tried to say, you know, what's going on in the world and how can we try to build peace, demand peace and counter the dominant narratives that are so oftentimes invested in a status quo in which military solutions are offered as the answer. And this, I think really, you know, in many ways, I'm gonna skip these. This is how, this is how all these women came to Colorado, by the way, this is the program we run, it's really fun. But you'll see, oh, I wanna, I wanna skip to this. Although I do wanna tell you that all of those stories, if you wanna hear them, are on this podcast called What the World Will Become that I launched. It's a little embarrassing to share this. Um, but it's a, it's a podcast. You can get it anywhere that the podcast, anywhere you get your podcasts. And I think it's got some really inspiring stories. But the epilogue really here is this. When, when the, all of those people I just shared with you um, all came through the Igli Summer Institutes. And uh, on the 7th of October, um, when all of you were um, also, I'm sure, waking up to the horrific news of Hamas's massacre in Israel, one of our alums was in her kibbutz with a view of the Gaza border, um, and we couldn't get a hold of her for hours. Um, so many of us have people directly affected by what's happening there. And, you know, she did survive. She survived with her daughter. Um, but many members of the, you know, the, the peace movement were killed and many other people, of course, were killed in this really horrific way. And I think what I wanna say, and I think it's possible to talk more about this, but that one of the things that really strikes me as necessary is these organized group of people demanding other solutions, demanding peaceful solutions, talking about the importance of human beings all human beings from across the globe as you know the kind of core decency of humanity deserving to respect and to honor and i've been you know very um in some ways um following right the the kind of outpouring of organizing the outpouring of folks that are trying to organize to say you know this was horrific and let's 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 try to let's try to bring this war this horrific you know war to a close as soon as possible with a ceasefire and you know i think that this really speaks to the to the to the real kind of crux of what's going on with gender justice across the world which is that we need an investment we need a prioritization of this grassroots creative 
bottom-up types of activist-led movements to challenge war and other violent systems like dictatorship um, and authoritarian regimes. And that that, gra that groundswell of people is, they're out there, right? I think that's the part that I find so encouraging is that in all of the work that I've done over the years, you hear the stories like Esther in Rwanda who survived in a well only to find ways to try to rebuild her community in the aftermath. You find people like Christine, who have, were profoundly affected by the Korean War in other ways, who are fighting to this day to try to re, reunite families that were separated by the, by the, um, you know, the parallel in, in Korea. These activist movements, I think in many ways, are holding the line and they're, they're creating an alternative to the discourse of violence that exists in so many parts of our public sphere. So I will leave it at that and just say that I'd love to chat about any of it um, and all of it if you have questions. And I really thank you so much for your attention tonight. I'm grateful for all of you being here. I will walk around with the mic so that you can ask your questions, but I would like to kick it off by asking, in your research, what correlation have you found between access to education and improvements in gender justice around the world? Thanks, Deb. I think that's a great question. And starting I mean, with the easy one. Okay, so here, so here's 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 what I would say is that I don't think there's anything more important than education, and we see oftentimes education systems sometimes being um, co-opted for teaching things that are quite hostile. And so I see education not only as happening in the classroom, but I actually think it happens when Kay runs these theater groups or stands up on a bus and says, you know, we actually need to think about a collective action problem of all these, you know, little fruit things, right? I think that I would just say that we've seen powerful correlations between access to education and women's equality, but we also, I think, um, uh, you know, and I think if, if you're looking for statistics, you can, you can absolutely see that in places that have higher rates of um, uh, female participation in both primary, secondary, and then eventually tertiary education, you have better outcomes for women, for sure. And there are correlations between education and women in politics. And in fact, one of the most powerful things of, about women in politics in general, and this varies a lot over the world, but you tend to see more spending. If a legislature has a high percentage of women in government, you tend to see more spending on healthcare and education, which is really important, I think. So um, without a doubt, I think, you know, I think we need to think about also how education systems can be used to, 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 to teach beyond, I think in some ways, what the state curriculums oftentimes ask them to teach, um, and towards teaching a, a you know a, a curriculum that really does embrace these values of of equality and of justice. Thank you. Uh, uh, you talked about individuals who have made an impact. Are there countries that are a best practice or some place to look for hope? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, these metrics change sometimes government to government, right? Because I would have said, you know, um, Sweden a couple of years ago in some ways, and then the Sweden had a different government takeover. They abandoned their feminist foreign policy, things like that. So things do change. I think New Zealand has been a place where a lot of people have looked. I think Iceland is a place people have looked. Um, I, you know, I, I, I hate to also just name a bunch of global North European countries, um, uh, or New Zealand's obviously not European, but you know what I mean. And, you know, but I do think like for, for New Zealand, for instance, one of the things that's gotten a lot of accolades for, it just released a national security policy that, that is very, very gender inclusive and that talks about security, not just as something that is like a military um, type of security, but about clean water, you know, access to making sure that there isn't this destruction of the climate. It talks about the importance of, of making sure queer communities and LGBTQ communities are safe. Um, it talks about um, thinking about, uh, you know, security from a human security framework. 
So there's, I think there's place, and actually it's worth reading. It's, um, that's a, it's a great security strategy, right? Um, that, that looks at alternatives to military responses to conflict. And that's what I'm really getting at here, right? I think that when military, we have only military responses in our arsenal, we, we really risk this problem of violence begets violence, right? And I think we entrench problems for future generations that we don't really fundamentally solve. I'm, I'm speaking in, in, you know, I think there's, there's nuances and complexities to what I just said in different cases, but I admire states that have tried to redefine that and to think about putting diplomacy first, to think about security as being rooted in human connections and relationships, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's actually a great indices, it's at the Georgetown Women, Peace and Security Center that ranks countries in the world as the best places to live if you're a woman. And I know it kind of went quite viral after some of the um, recent Supreme Court uh, uh, cases in the past year because people, people like, you know, were like, where should I move? <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I do think some of these, these, these Scandinavian models, these kind of, again, more social democratic kind of spots tend to get, tend to show up well. But I don't think that, I think that there's also a lot of promise and hope in other places. And I've seen some pretty beautiful experiments in places that are in our, our so-called global south. Um, you know, in which you see different sort of, I think, values being centered and, and the possibility for um, justice to, to, to unfold, not necessarily always at the national level, but sometimes at the local level, the municipal level. So I think that matters as well. And I'm happy to talk more about that too. Thanks. Hi, my name's Kendra. Um, thank you for speaking today. I have a question. I'm going to be taking some graduate classes at CU Boulder in the spring. Um, and I've been exploring their resources and it's not very obvious. There's, there's a lot of good resources, but they don't have a lot going on where I could help disrupt violent systems and things like that and protests. So I see that you are a professor. Do you have any um, resources for how to get involved more? Yes, so um, yes. <laughs> and we can talk afterwards too if you want. Um, I. You know, for instance, just what's going on right now, right? Um, it's very hard if you're looking at the New York Times or, you know, the mainstream news to understand where people are meeting, organizing to try to do peace demonstrations, right? And the reality is that there are a couple of organizations, I think, that are doing this quite well. Um, you know, for instance, Jewish Voices for Peace, right? For in, in this current context, I think if you look at like, uh, other organizations, Rising Majority, Madre, groups like that, that are doing more national level organizing, um, not just about this topic, but about a lot of topics, especially related to justice and, and, and inclusion and, and um, empowerment and things like that. Um, campuses are interesting because campuses are, I'm at the University of Denver, right? So I don't know the Boulder's um, campus as well but I know that some of the most powerful work is being done by student groups and that those of us like myself who now direct centers are able to sort of create these synergies where we try to support what the students are interested in organizing around through funding or through you know, administrative support. And we also try to shine a light on issues that students are really passionate about. And so you know, we're trying to, I think, be responsive at the same time we're in a really difficult moment, I think, for questions of free speech on campus, and there's a lot of pushback um, for organizing, um, and it's it's really worrisome pushback. Um, uh, so I would just say, think at different levels. Think at the levels of the you know the Zoom webinars that I am tired of, but I still think matter, right? For some of those national level organizing actions. Think about the state level work that's happening around substantive issue areas. So issues related, say a peace, peace work or you know, um, reproductive justice work or um, you know, um, LGBTQ youth kind of protection work, things like that. A lot of state and multi-state coalitions exist there. And then think about the micro level, right? This kind of level of what's happening on the campus. And I, you know, I think 
that oftentimes activism requires bravery and it requires some courage and it requires some risk taking. And I think all of the women whose stories I shared with you tonight have, have done a lot of that. And so one of my other just suggestions is to learn from, learn and be in community with folks that are doing that, that work. Um, you know, and I think solidarity is really important. And um, the more we, I think, center stories of people that are trying to change systems and to challenge um, violence, I think we get comforted that we're not alone sometimes in thinking that we're the only one that, that cares about that. Um, because we don't see some of these stories ending up as you know headlines on the news very often. They're not the stories of, you know, that end up, I think, capturing people's attention. And yet, I think they're powerful for, again, building that, that coalition of folks that wants to build a better world. Um, and so I do think sharing them is, you know, is also activist work. Hi, I'm Wes, and uh, uh, thank you for your comments. I'm curious, on the global stage, on the global stage, are there other movements that are most contiguous to your effort and those that obviously are antagonistic. Can you give us a little insight into those that are that you can readily ally with versus those that are in opposition? Yes, although I think my political biases would become very clear if that <laughs> if that happens. Um, you know, I was listening to CPR on the way over here. Um, maybe some of you were as well about the takeover of a lot of these school boards in Colorado by this kind of movement to return us to Bible education. And you know, I that's not my <laughs> that's not my preference. Um, and you know, so I just think that when you when you ask about you know what are the movements that are antagonistic, there's a lot of really really I would say very very smart fierce work happening to organize on a an agenda that is really diametrically opposed with what I see as an agenda for peace and justice. And so you know, I think in some ways those of us that believe in peace and justice can learn something from you know how the Tea Party organized and how some of these coalitions are being built. Um, and at the same time, I think you know um, we also need to think about what has fractured a lot of the organizing movements because we're there's a lot of fraught, difficult stuff happening, especially on left movements that are um, that are focused on what I think I would say the long term vision of peace and justice, but oftentimes have very different strategies for getting there. I, I, I'm a board member of Women Cross DMZ. I think it's a beautiful organization that tries to bring peace to the Korean Peninsula, but also demand, um, a, it really offer a challenge to US militarization more generally, to always demand diplomatic responses first, to think about the way in which we, um, you know, again, solve, can solve problems as human beings in relationship with others rather than through the kind of brute force of war. And I think, you know, so organizations like that give me a lot of hope. Um, an organization in Israel and Palestine called Women Wage Peace was very connected to the Women Cross DMZ. It was a group of women from, you know, kind of all sides of, of the conflict that were saying, look, we need to talk first in terms of peace. And to really, again, just provide a counterweight to the narrative, the kind of, um, you know, more warmonger narrative that tends to be, you know, proffered by both sides. And I think um, I, you know, so I, those peace movements I find to be very powerful. I uh, interviewed Lema Bowie, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, two weeks ago at the, at World, with World Denver. And Lema, if those of you who know her story, she was involved with this type of grassroots, bottom-up women's organization in Liberia during the war to the point where this women's group came and sat in during the peace negotiations with Charles Taylor. And when the peace negotiations were about to fail and they were about to, to end without a resolution to the conflict, Lema stood up and she started taking off her clothes. Because in Liberia, if you see your mother naked, it's a shame on you. And so she took this kind of cultural knowledge around what it meant to see a mother's body kind of in this state. And she shamed those men to go back into the room to finish hammering out the peace deal, right? And these women sat in for weeks at the office, at the building, trying to say, we, the women of Liberia, do not want this war. 
right? And this is the this is the type of change I think that people can make in the world with this idea of direct action, of civil resistance, of nonviolent work to organize, to try to make it very inconvenient for people to stop the diplomatic negotiations, right? It's a great, it, it's actually will be the eighth episode of that podcast I mentioned, is the interview I had with Lema. So you can hear in her, her own terms her talking about what it felt like to, to stand there and think what tools do I have at my, at my disposition to try to bring peace. So those, you know, again, center the, center the peace activists. I, I think it's an important thing to remember that I think at the end of the day, more of us are much more on the side of peace than on the side of war in general, but it's that the voices are easy to get drowned out, right? Um, so, so I hope that is a somewhat, <laughs> there's a lot more I could say about movements that I think are amazing. So uh, the women in Iran are trying to get freedom and men support them. Do you think they have a chance? Oh, that's such a hard question. I'm very worried about what's happening with Iran right now. And I'll say, I'll say something that might not be satisfactory because I don't know the answer to that. But I, I sure as hell hope so. <laughs> you know, I, I really want that women life freedom movement to, because it's so powerful and it's so brave. And, and yet we're seeing a backlash, right? One of the women who um, has participated in this program, um, Choman Hardy, she's, she's from the Iraqi side of Kurdistan. Um, but the, 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 the initial slogan of um, women life freedom is a Kurdish slogan. And you know the person um, Masha Amini who was murdered, um, she was Kurdish. So a lot of the early organizing happened in this kind of Kurdish region in, in Iran. And I will say that we, you know I have both a lot of hope for all the fierceness and, and the power. I have a new student actually who's just come from the, that movement, who's now a graduate student at Corbell. Um, and there's a lot of amazing work that's happening. Do I know if they'll succeed? I really don't know, and I'm, I would say I'm very worried about what's happening with Iran right now in light of what's happening in Israel and, and Palestine. But this, the less satisfactory answer that I'm gonna give you is this, which is that sometimes I actually don't think the question is, does the movement succeed? We see movements not succeed all the time, right? That doesn't mean they don't matter and it doesn't mean that the people who participate them in them are not fundamentally changed. I think there's something about the process of being in solidarity and in community with people, fighting for a better world that is substantive and transformative. And it might not lead to particular outcomes that we are our are, are real kind of main goals, but I think that it changes, it, it shifts the needle. And I think that's what we need to do all the time. And the, the, the reality is that there's nothing too small. There's, there's not any one of us in this room that can't do something to shift the needle, right? We're so, I mean, we're so, we feel so, I think in some ways, unequipped or isolated or ultimately unable to stop so much of the horror that exists in the world. And all I would say is there's a, there's a brilliant organizer um, named Adrian Marie Brown who says small is all, right? The idea that sometimes it's in relationship with one other person that shifts the course of their life that has a ripple effect. Sometimes it's about, you know, making space for somebody's experience to be seen and heard. Sometimes em empathetic listening is actually what people need more than anything else. Right? And it changes something about their experience on this planet. And so I just, I just would say that no matter what, women, life, freedom in Iran has changed the world. Right? It's changed the world, it's changed Iran, and it's changed all of us that have observed, I think, the bravery of, of that movement. And I sure as hell hope that it continues to thrive and continues to do important and powerful work. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, and thank you to, to Dr. Marie Berry.